The Prince and the Pauper is one of literature's most beloved stories. Twain tells the tale of two lookalike boys who trade outfits one afternoon and as a result, trade lives as well. The future king, Edward, temporarily assumes the identity of his impoverished brother from another mother, Tom Canty. The prince becomes a pauper. The pauper, for a season, lives as a prince. Mistaken for a poor beggar, Prince Edward experiences the harsh streets of England for himself. And as you can imagine, life outside the royal palace is much different and quite difficult. If a make-believe story, such as The Prince and the Pauper, holds our attention and grips our soul, how much more so should the miraculous incarnation of Christ? As you turn in your Bibles... Again, this morning to John 1.14, we realize that this verse highlights the greatest riches to rags story in history. But unlike the prince and the pauper, Jesus' incarnation is fact, not fiction. It's history not mythology. And it is a vastly superior story because it involves an infinitely greater condescension. The marvelous and mysterious words of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, we read, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sake, he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. The title of this new series, within the Gospel of John, is The God Who Became Human. The God Who Became Human. And during these messages, I want you to reflect on the following questions. How do I view the incarnation of Christ? Does this part of the gospel humble me to the core? Does it move my soul to new levels of praise? Church, are we still amazed when we consider the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And tragically, people probably know more about the COVID-19 virus than the glorious incarnation, wherein the immortal word took on mortal flesh and dwelt among us. Which begs the question, Why are evangelicals content to have an elementary understanding of one of the most awe-inspiring doctrines in all the Bible? As we unpack the riches of John 1, 14 through 18, it is my pastoral goal to reverse this most unfortunate trend. Specifically, I want to increase our understanding and appreciation of John 1.14 that we might love the incarnate Christ with greater fervor. It is truth preached, seeking to pierce our hearts that we might serve the Lord with renewed purpose. As we already sang this morning, Come now, let us behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He, the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has 
Come, John 1, 9 through 13. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. John 1, 14 through 18. Though proving Christ absolute deity is the overarching purpose of John's gospel. Here, the blessed Savior's true humanity takes center stage. And you say, well, how important is this profound doctrine? Friend, there is no salvation apart from incarnation. No incarnation, no salvation. Without John 1.14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, there's no perfect life, which is our robe of righteousness. There's no substitutionary death on the cross, for God cannot die. And there's certainly no bodily resurrection. And that's deadly serious, as Paul points out in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 19, when he gives the seven devastating consequences of a resurrectionless gospel. In summary, without the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, all of our believing loved ones would be in hell. This is a profoundly mysterious yet essential truth concerning Jesus. And John will summarize the grandeur and glory of it all in this glorious gospel. Without the incarnation, Christianity goes up in smoke. And this is why the Spirit of God led John to write in his second epistle, verse 7, chapter 1, understanding that there were deceivers, false teachers, claiming to be representatives of God, who were denying the true humanity of Jesus. And in 2 John chapter 1, verse 7, he writes, For many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist, small eight. Anyone from the Pope to a Protestant preacher, anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ, does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. Well, now that I have your undivided attention this morning, let's read together John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The opening prologue in John's gospel introduces us to the most important and controversial person to ever live. And that is Jesus Christ. In verses 14 through 18, tell us that Jesus is the incarnate word of God. It is absolutely essential that you know, understand, and believe this. He adds another truth claim to a laundry list that has already been established in the opening 
section of this glorious and signature gospel and scripture that Jesus is the incarnate word of God. And over the next few weeks, we are going to consider the what and the why of the incarnation. What is it that we're talking about? And why is it so important? The what and the why of the mysterious and marvelous incarnation of Jesus Christ. Let's begin then this morning with the what. Exactly what is meant when someone says that Jesus is the incarnate Word of God? And I would ask that you write down the following three subpoints A, B, and C. Letter A. Firstly, the eternal Word became truly human. This is the first thing we need to know and understand and believe that the eternal word became truly human. That Greek word flesh in verse 14 has to do with the physical. God became a genuine human being. The pre existent word took on genuine flesh. Or to say it with, with greater theological precision, God the Son was made the God-man, Jesus. He who is absolutely divine, the one who has always existed as the eternal Son of God, adored by the angels in heaven, enjoying perfect unbroken fellowship with the Father, the uncreated creator of all things became mysteriously and marvelously truly human. And this is an absolutely fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. It is taught here in John's gospel. It is affirmed in a hundred other places. I'll just read to you a few passages. You can write them down where we find that the human nature of Jesus Christ is, is explicitly taught in several places. You can write down Romans chapter 1, verse 13, a book of the Bible that is intended to teach us about the gospel, that the gospel of grace is by grace through faith in Christ alone. And in his introduction, Paul draws attention, as John does in his gospel, to the true humanity of Christ. Romans 1, verse 3, concerning God's Son, who was born of a descendant of David, and here it is, according to the flesh. 1 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16. This is a great passage to meditate on. In all seasons, this is what 1 Timothy 3.16 says, and by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was manifested in the flesh, there it is, he who was manifested in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, beheld by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Glance down again, if you would, at John 1.14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That could be paraphrased. The word became flesh and stayed a while. And you say, well, how long did the incarnate word remain on earth? It wasn't a three-day stay at an Airbnb. He stayed for over 30 years. 
Not only did the Son of God willingly take on human flesh, but John's gospel tells us that he tabernacled among us. That he stayed for over three decades. I want you to stop and think about this for a moment. Come behold the wondrous mystery. Not only did he just assume humanity, he tabernacled among men. He experienced a true humanity. And of course, Jesus lived more in 30 or 33 years than we live in 100 What am I talking about? What is implied here in John 1.14? Well, as a genuine human, Jesus experienced a bona fide childbirth. This is one of the things that Muslim apologists can't get over. That one would it believe what the scriptures say that the Son of God descended through the birth canal of a woman. Come behold the wondrous mystery. Now, albeit it was a miraculous conception. Now, last week I (laughs) made a mistake in talking about affirming the virgin birth, which we clearly do, but I said the miraculous, uh, we talked about the immaculate conception What I meant to say was the miraculous conception. Jesus was born of a virgin. It was a spirit-wrought miracle. But we do not believe what the Catholics believe, which is not found in Scripture, that Mary was sinless. But we do believe that Mary was Jesus' earthly mother. In other words, man's maker was made man. Come behold the wondrous mystery. This is the what of the incarnation. This also means that as a child, Jesus was born. The scriptures tell us that as a child, the incarnate word grew. He grew in wisdom and favor and stature with God and with man. Luke chapter 2 Verse 52, as a man, the God-man ate and drank. He, he, he just participated in an ordinary human activity. He does so at the wedding at Cana, John chapter 2. We read about Jesus making breakfast at the beach after his resurrection. In John 21, we read about Jesus even dining with, with sinners and tax collectors. It's a great scandal for the religious self-righteous in Mark's gospel chapter 2, verses 15 to 22. Think about it for a moment. As a man, Jesus was tempted by Satan. Matthew chapter 4. The first man, Adam, was tempted by Satan in the garden and failed. The last Adam, Jesus, was tempted in the wilderness and overcame. He was tempted at all points as we are. A remarkable statement, yet without sin. Come behold the wondrous mystery. Marvel at the feet of the incarnate word of God. As a man, Jesus experienced pain, internal agony, and deep, deep sorrow. He said in the Garden of Gethsemane, my soul is grieved to the point of death. Pain, distress, agony. Matthew 26 and 27, Jesus, the man, experienced it. John chapter 4, he's tired and thirsty, so he stops at the well 
in Samaria. John chapter 11. The resurrection and the life. There at the funeral and grave of Lazarus, Scripture tells us, and Jesus wept. He wept. And all that he endured on the cross, John 18 and 19, not only being misrepresented and, and treated like a common criminal, but even betrayed by one who pretended to be his friend. What do we need to understand? First of all, the eternal word became truly human. The Prince of Glory willingly became a lowly pauper. Philippians 2, 7 and 8. By addition, not subtraction. John 1, 14 to 18. Colossians 2, verse 9. The Prince became a pauper. Now the why of that mysterious and marvelous truth communicated here in the Gospel of John we'll talk about in, in a moment, but there are two more subpoints that I need to mention. We will explore these in greater depth next week, but I at least need to give them to you this morning. The Son of God, we saw firstly, became truly human. But secondly, letter B, we need to make sure we get this. The eternal word was without sin. He was truly human, but he was without sin. This is why the, the virgin birth is an absolutely critical doctrine. Sinners beget sinners. We're born sinners. David said, in sin, my mother conceived me, Psalm 51. So it had to be an actual birth in order for Jesus to be truly human. But it had to be a supernatural conception so that Jesus would be born in a sense like the first man when God created him in the garden. Jesus was sinless at birth and he remained sinless up through his death, resurrection, and ascension. That's why scripture refers to him as the spotless, unblemished lamb of God. Thirdly, we need to note that the eternal word became truly human, very, very, very important, but he never ceased to be God. He never ceased to be God. Again, this is a profound, profound mystery. The word of God would have us to know that in becoming what he was not, human, Jesus did not cease for a second to be what he has always been. And that, of course, is the eternal, majestic Son of God. Now, I, I need to flash letters B and, out, B and C out more no, next week, but... In the interest of time, I, I want to end this morning by showing you that profound biblical truths, such as the incarnation, are not only profoundly important, but they are most of the time, if not always, profoundly practical. Anybody who downplays and minimizes doctrine and theology, which many do today in the contemporary church, are misreading and wrongly teaching 
the scriptures. It's why we seek to do what we, we do when we proclaim the truth of God's word. This profound mystery, this profound miracle, this profound reality is profoundly practical. And the authors of Scripture under divine inspiration understood this full well. I would like you to turn with me now in your Bibles as we draw this message to a close to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We'll talk more next Lord's Day about the what of the incarnation and also about the why of the incarnation, but I don't want to leave this message simply by having us marvel at the glory of God becoming man. A sinless man, one who never ceased to be God, but a God man nonetheless. A thoughts on such a reality certainly should lead to a, a lifetime of grateful contemplation as we behold the wondrous mystery. But here in 2 Corinthians 8 through 10, Paul is going to encourage the Corinthians to continue to give sacrificially. And so he, he wants to motivate them by reminding them of the perfect example of Jesus. He will encourage this body of believers to continue to give sacrificially. You might even call it incarnation-centered generosity. This is how profoundly practical the doctrine of Christ's incarnation is. What every church leader seeks to do in the economy of God's grace is to motivate, exhort, and encourage God's people to be the kind of people God calls us to be as followers of this Jesus. To give cheerfully, willingly, and sacrificially. To give until it hurts. Let me ask you this. Is this how you're known at church? Are you known for being a sacrificial servant of the Lord? Do people know you as being liberal in the best sense? Generous? Is this how you're known at home? Some of you need to consider whether or not you're one person here in another place, another person when you're at home with your wife and your kids, when the cameras are off. Is this how you're known as a Christian in the workplace? So here in 2 Corinthians 8 through 10, in effort to raise money for the needs of the church, Paul points to the perfect example of the eternal Lord of glory. This is incarnation-centered exposition, calling for gospel-centered generosity. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. One of the most beautiful, compelling, and convicting verses in all of God's word. Right up there with, second, with Philippians chapter 2. You know, beloved, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now God's grace is, is manifested in, in many ways. The grace of the cross of Christ. God's grace in creation. But here he is speaking, he is thinking of clearly the incarnation. The Son of God becoming truly human. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sake he became rich. Poor. 
And as if that's not enough, he who was rich yet for our sake became poor that you through his poverty might become rich. Come behold the wondrous mystery. Jesus sacrificed the riches of heaven when for love's sake, he became poor. This is not thinking predominantly about material wealth, the streets of gold coming and, you know, the son of man has no place to to even lay down his head, a a shelter over his head. That's certainly part of this, but, but this is talking about something far more profound and sacrificial. Philippians chapter two adds that not only did Jesus conceal his divine glory under the cloak of human flesh, but he came, not only did he come as a man, but he came as a bondservant. The eternal, always existing, divine, pre-existent, co-existent, Trinitarian, uncreated creator, light and life, self-existent son of God. For love's sake, he became poor. He came not simply as a man, Philippians 2 tells us, but as a slave, as a servant. And as a lowly servant king, Jesus washed the feet of his own disciples the humility of Christ's love, the generosity of Jesus' grace. And later, Jesus one-ups himself. He not only came as a servant and washed his proud disciples' feet, but he would then go to take on our sin and would die on a shameful scandalous cross. We are the cursed ones because we cannot keep God's law perfectly. Cursed is everyone who does not fulfill the law of God. Galatians chapter three. And yet Galatians reminds us, cursed is everyone who hangs from a tree. For love's sake, he who was rich became poor. He was revered and honored in in glory. Willingly came as a servant and was even willing to be cursed in his role as a substitutionary sacrifice. The incarnation of Jesus is not only profoundly important, it is also profoundly practical. This is what comes to my heart and mind when I read John 1.14, and the eternal word of God took on flesh and dwelt among us. Or in the words of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, though he being rich, willingly became poor. And an added wonder of it all, he did this for you. He did this for me. So that those who had nothing might through Jesus become joint heirs of Christ. So in view of this doctrine, Christians should be the most generous and sacrificial people on the planet. We are followers, after all, of the incarnate word of God. People often ask, well, how much money should I give? Speaking of offerings, collecting offerings, 2 Corinthians 8 through 10. Friends, we're not under law. We're under the grace of the new covenant. And grace is a far more powerful motivator than law. And you say, well, God hasn't entrusted me with a ton of money. 
I, I wish I could do more, give more. If that's you, be generous. You can still be generous with what you have and what you don't have. Give what you can and trust that God knows your heart. But realize this. Some people have more time and energy to give. Gospel generosity can manifest itself in many different ways. The principle that is found here that is timeless and true, not only in terms of what is Paul seeking to do in the hearts of the Corinthians and the collection of this offering for other saints who had great needs, It's true of all the things that the Lord has given to us by way of stewardship. Some people have more money to give. But in all things, as we think about the incarnation, we should seek to be sacrificial and generous. Before we can add it here at Lake Country Bible Church, before we can add needed classroom space, sanctuary space, before we can bring on another missionary, before we can bring on Pastor Kent full-time, we need to eliminate our current bank obligations. Second Corinthians 8, 9, in the incarnation of John 1, 14, speaks to this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake... <laughs> He became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Beloved friends, may incarnation-centered generosity continue to be what defines us here at Lake Country Bible Church. We have this morning beheld the wondrous mystery. that he who was rich in love became poor. Sacrificial, giving till it hurts. Christ-like generosity. Christ came and set an example for us to follow. And God has given to us an entire Bible that we can look to Christ, not only in our salvation, but that we might look to Christ as we seek to grow and be useful to the Lord in our sanctification. This is one of the reasons why I can't get enough of the gospel of John. Let us pray. Incarnate word, humbly we bow before your majesty. Thank you for sacrificing so much to save undeserving sinners like us and for taking us from rags to riches. We marvel, not simply at Christmas time, we marvel all the time at the mystery of the incarnation. As we look at your perfect example in this study, may the words of 2 Corinthians 8, 7, be acted upon with renewed earnestness. As Paul exhorted the Corinthians, may we all excel in the grace of giving, be it our time and energy or our money and material things. Not out of mere obligation, certainly not out of cold-hearted duty, but out of incarnation-motivated humility, generosity, and love. This we pray in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen.